Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. Wisdom is the final frontier in gaining true knowledge. Our mission is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Hello, my friend. This is Gramps. Thanks for coming along on our journey to increase wisdom and create a living legacy. Today is day 1,564 of our trek, and it is time for Meditation Monday. Taking time to relax, refocus, and reprioritize your lives is crucial in order to create a living legacy. For you, it may be just a time alone for quiet reflection, or you may utilize some sort of structured meditation practices. In my life, meditation includes reading and reflecting on God's Word and in prayer. It is a time to renew my mind, refocus on what is most important, and making sure that I am nurturing my soul, mind, and body. As you come along with me on our trek each Meditation Monday, it is my hope and prayer that you too will experience a time of reflection and renewing of your mind. We are continuing our series this week on Meditation Monday as we focus on mastering Bible study through a series of brief insights from Hebrew scholar Dr. Michael S. Heiser. Our current insights are focusing on the accuracy of interpreting the Bible. So today let's meditate on Bible study worldview of the authors, and word meanings. Insight number 57. You can't understand the Bible without understanding the worldview of the people who wrote it. I've talked before about the importance of context for interpretation. The context of the Bible involves many things. Think about the many contexts for anything we write. Our past and present experiences naturally color the way we look at the world. What enters our minds in various forms of media becomes part of how we intellectually process the world, how we were taught to express ourselves, inform us, and how we communicate. We are the product of the intellectual climate and resources that we absorbed, and so were the biblical writers. Much of what we find in the Bible cannot be understood well or even at all unless we see what's written through ancient eyes. We must be able to think like the ancient writer. Doing this requires sharing his worldview. Obviously, we can't hope to accomplish this task completely, but we do providentially live in a time where it is more possible than ever to get inside the head of biblical writers with respect to their worldview. The key to discovering the biblical writer's worldview is to read material that reflects their time and culture. Archaeology is uncovering a large amount of intellectual output of the cultures that were part of the biblical world. Numerous tablets and manuscripts have been translated into English. That makes it possible for us to think more like they did. We can not only read about what the people of Egypt, Babylon, and Canaan wrote and thought, we can read the material ourselves. Some outstanding resources help us to navigate this terrain. The best starting point are two books, Ancient Text for the Study of the Hebrew Bible and Ancient Text for New Testament Studies. Both volumes are guides to the background literature produced by the civilizations of the ancient biblical world. The nine-volume Zondervan Illustrated Bible Background Commentary is also a premium reference tool. Among the many resources these titles will direct you to are anthologies, collections of ancient English translation texts. The most up-to-date scholarly set is a three-volume Context of Scripture. James Pritchard's Ancient Near Eastern Text Relating to the Old Testament is a one-volume anthology. Other volumes focus solely on the writer or collection, such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, Josephus, or Philo. Access to thinking as the ancient biblical world has never been more widely available, and in many cases, it's fairly affordable. Let's move on to insight number 58. What a word meant before the writer lived isn't an indicator of what it meant to the writer. Word study is one of the most common Bible study strategies for folks who have moved beyond merely reading the Bible. The goal of word study is to penetrate your Bible translation to detect the author's words in the original biblical language. Strong's numbers are one strategy for doing this. Once you know the original language word, the goal is to discern whether the translator chose the best meaning from among the possible senses that the word might have. Dictionaries of words in the biblical languages, which is referred to as lexicons, help Bible students with their task. Word study is far more than looking up the words in the original language dictionaries, though. The effort has many pitfalls. One of the most common is the notion of what the word meant originally when it first became part of the language, or in its most ancient usage, somehow the real meaning of that word. Such thinking, though, is flawed. Consider the word monotheism. 
a word we understand as denoting to the existence of only one God. This isn't the word's original meaning. The word monotheism first appeared in English in 1616 as an antonym to atheism. So originally, monotheism meant belief in God as opposed to the rejection of that belief. The original meaning of monotheism really doesn't lend itself to the way we think of the word today. In our time, we'd use monotheism in discussion about polytheism, not about atheism. The meaning of biblical words might change with time. For example, the Hebrew word gear, G-E-R, can refer to a foreigner, a resident alien, or a sojourner or traveler. The correct nuance depends on the historical circumstances of the Old Testament book in which it is found. If the book was written at a time when Israel was a nation with its own land, then the first two options are viable. If not, the third option is more likely. The circumstances of its occurrence in one book in the Bible really doesn't say anything about its meaning elsewhere. Once again, context is king, where meaning does not derive from the chronology of its usage. Word meaning is driven by current context, such as the type of literature in which the word appears or genre, or the writer's circumstances, which helps us to know if the usage might be metaphorical instead of literal. And let's end today with our verse, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. And that's a wrap for today's meditation. Next week we will continue our trek on Meditation Monday as we take time to reflect on what is most important in creating our living legacy. Thank you for joining me for this trek that we call life. Encourage your friends and family to join us and then come along with us tomorrow for another day of Wisdom Trek, Creating a Legacy. If you'd like to listen to any of the past 1,568 daily treks or read the daily journals, they are all available at wisdom-trek.com. And I encourage you to subscribe to Wisdom Trek on your favorite podcast player so that each day will be downloaded to you automatically. And thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you tomorrow for another snippet of wisdom.